Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm Sandy Zip. I'm the director of the Urban Studies Program in Urban Studies and American Studies. And I want to welcome you to the, I think it's the fourth edition of our What is the Urban Now, our uh, 50 years of, of, of Urban Studies celebration we're having all year. Um, I think we're really lucky to have with us today Tony Griffin and in conversation with Rebecca Carter, our colleague in anthropology and urban studies. All right, but first I want to tell you a little bit about this um, program and this uh, milestone. We're taking this uh, milestone as kind of an opportunity to engage in this year-long calendar of conversations about how we, as students, teachers, researchers, should be thinking about cities, urbanization, and urbanist practice and history uh, in the here and now, in this moment. Our first goal here, though, in keeping with the program's main mission as the convener of an undergraduate concentration here at Brown, is to think together about what it means to, be, to become an urbanist today. How should students be thinking about what urbanization means and how cities are going to work or not work in the future? Um, Urban Studies was first established at Brown in 1971 in the form of a faculty committee charged with establishing new courses in urban studies to join those already existing in the departments of political science, sociology, economics, history, and engineering. And it was founded, uh, like many other similar programs in urban studies at the time, at a moment when cities were seen as a source of special concern. This was the era of the so-called urban crisis in the United States, in which cities were seen to be the source of so-called, quote unquote, urban problems, deindustrialization, poverty, segregation, racial strife, suburbanization. We still live in the long tail of all those issues, but for the last few decades, those older concerns were filtered through, I think, a somewhat different story that have brought a, uh, no, a newer generation to urban studies, one of so-called urban resurgence and vibrancy, all of which threw up new kinds of problems, gentrification, housing informality, displacement, racialized policing, sprawl. You all will know them from your classes. Uh, but uh, I think this was a, a kind of hopeful time, a time of thinking that cities were a place where problems were going to be solved as much as created. Um, and then I think in the last few years, we've started to see uh, perhaps that not fall away as well, but a new kind of moment it, uh, again, a new uh, sort of time of urbanization in, in, in the United States and abroad in, the, in global cities as well. Uh, another kind of time when big cities have priced themselves out of success in some kinds of ways. Climate change and global pandemic have thrown all the previous sureties up in the air. Right? So we're in some ways having to rethink the history and present of urbanism for a new time. And over the course of this year, we've been having a number of guests from a number of different disciplines to help us push our thinking along. So I hope you will join us in the coming months uh, when we will be joined uh, not only by Tony Griffin, but by Ananya Roy um, in conversation with our colleague Theo Wickland um, and Tom Segru in conversation with our colleague um, Jim Marone. Um, today, we are very lucky to have Tony Griffin from the Harvard GSD with us, and she's going to be in conversation with my colleague, uh, Rebecca Carter from Anthropology and Urban Studies, and I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca to begin. Thanks, everybody, for coming. So thank you, Sandy, and welcome, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Tony Griffin. Tony is founder of Urban Design and Planning for the American City, Urban AC, based in New York, a planning and design management practice that works with public, private, and nonprofit partnerships to reimage, reshape, and rebuild just cities and communities. The practice designs and leads complex and transformative social and spatial urban revitalization projects, addressing historic and current disparities involving race, class, and generation. Over the past 10 years, she has successfully collaborated with several major US cities on the cusp of just social and economic recovery, including and most recently Chicago, Indianapolis, Rochester, and St. Louis. Ms. Griffin is also a professor in practice of urban planning at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where she teaches design studios and seminars also rooted in issues of social and spatial justice. She is founder and director of the Just City Lab, a Harvard-based center and applied research platform that investigates the ways design can have a positive impact on addressing the conditions of injustice in cities. Griffin received her Bachelor's of Architecture from the University of Notre Dame and a Loeb Fellowship from Harvard GSD. She was previously visiting Associate Professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning at UC Berkeley 
and professor of architecture at the City College of New York, where she founded the J. Max Bond Center on Design for the Just City at the Spitzer School of Architecture. Outside of academia, she was previously the director of community development for the city of Newark, New Jersey, vice president and director of design for the Anacostia Waterfront Corporation in Washington, DC, and deputy director for revitalization and neighborhood planning for the DC Office of Planning. She began her career with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, an architecture, urban planning, and engineering firm in Chicago, where she became an associate partner working on projects in Chicago, Barcelona, and London. Tony is the author of multiple articles on design justice and co-editor of The Just City Essays, published in 2015, and the upcoming publication, The Just City Dialogues, Disruptive Design. She has lectured extensively in the US, Netherlands, South Africa, and South America. Between 2016 and 2020, she also served as an Obama presidential appointee, appointee to the US Commission on Fine Arts. And she was also the 2022 recipient of the Edmund N. Bacon Urban Design Award given by Philadelphia's Center for Architecture and Design. So we are extremely lucky to have her with us today. Please join me in welcoming Tony Griffith. Oh, it feels way too long. <laughs> <laughs> That's only half of it. <laughs> So to give you all a sense of how this is going to go, I do have some questions prepared. And I know that Tony has some corresponding slides. But we're going to try to keep it as informal and conversational as possible. But I want to mention before we get started that Tony's visit is a highlight for a course that I'm teaching this semester on the Just City. And the students and I have been preparing together for this event. So I want to give special thanks to them. Many of them are here. Can they be acknowledge themselves? Yeah, please raise your hand so we can see who you are. Yeah, great. And hopefully we'll have a chance to hear from some of them directly during the Q&A as well. I know how to point you out. <laughs> we know where you are now. So. We wanna, and we want to try to prioritize students' questions mm -hmm. when we get to the Q&A. So Absolutely. ready, everybody. So let's begin. Um, I wanted to start by asking you to talk about where you're from. And I know this is an important starting point in your work. In fact, where I'm from is the name of a key exercise and participatory tool in the community-based work of the Just City Lab. And so I'm particularly interested in your early experiences in Chicago. What led you to know, I think it was at age 14, mm -hmm. that you wanted to be an <laughs> architect. And how would you describe some of your early social, spatial, educational, or other influences? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much um, for having me. I haven't been in Providence in many, many years. Um, and I've never been on campus. So I'm really excited to be here. And in fact, um, one of my high school best friends came here. She was the one to come east. So it's kind of cool to be here. And I s snapped a couple of pictures, and I'm going to text her momentarily to let her know I made it to her alma mater. Um, and you know, I was really happy that we were going to set this up as an informal conversation. So I'm also, if it's OK with you, you know, to have questions kind of filter in as we go. So it really feels like I'm in conversation with mm -hmm. all of you in the room and just me. And I can be super informal. So <laughs> I'm going to go back and forth between slides. I did not want to do a presentation. I just really wanted them to be supplemental to sharing my story and answering any questions that I can for you. So get comfortable, relax, sit on the couch, and let's just chat a little bit. So like how it all begins, and it's yes. funny because I often do presentations, or at least in the last few years, I have started presentations with a kind of origin story. So if you were to know me, just get to know me as a friend, I really don't talk about myself. Mm -hmm. But I find that in my public speaking to be reflective, like as opposed to a scholar, because I'm really not a scholar. I'm a practitioner. Uh, so I you know, resisted trying to fit myself into a box that I really wasn't. So talking reflectively is a natural space. Now, if you were to see me at a cocktail party, you'd have to pull information <laughs> out of me. So it's, very different. But anyway, so I, I started using this photograph. This is like my favorite um, uh, uh, gram in Chicago's grammar school, my favorite grammar school photograph because we're all seated, uh, which was unusual. I was super tall even at an early age. 
So I don't know if they still do class pictures like this, but uh, I was always the only girl. Well, there was actually me and Deneen Wyndham were the only two girls on the top <laughs> row with all of the boys. Um, so I like that this kind of just neutralized everyone. Um, but really what's telling about this, and as um, your professor said, I grew up in Chicago, the south side of Chicago, specifically, which is enormous, I should say, made up of um, many, many neighborhoods. Um, but in my part of town, in the south side, everyone looks like me. So looking like me was normal. I very rarely, in my day-to-day -day activities with my family, going to visit my grandmother, going shopping, going to school, going to play, did I see anybody who looked different from me? Which is probably like a lot of your experiences growing up, that you grew up around people who looked just like you, therefore you thought every, you were normal and people who looked like you were the normative, so to say. Um, the other reason I like this picture is, can anyone find me? <laughs> nah, probably not. But the other reason I like, did you find me? So the other reason I love this picture is because I'm in the front row. <laughs> Which was the only and last time that I was ever in the front row. You look so excited. Because I was in the front row. <laughs> it was very, very cool. And what's so funny is this kid right here is also named Tony Griffin. But his real name was Anthony, and the teacher refused to call him Anthony, so she called me by my first and middle name, which I hated. Mm. I mean, I loved my name, but it's like, his name is Anthony. Call him Anthony. Call me Tony. It's not short for anything. But anyway, that's another story. All right, so as your professor said, at 14, I decided I wanted to be an architect. And this was um, a result of a couple of things. One, I drew all the time when I was little, and my mother encouraged it, so I had a natural aptitude for it. And my mother always said, look, you're going to work the rest of your life. You might as well pick something that you love to do and that you're good at. And so that always stuck with me. Uh, the high school I went to was a science, math, and technical school that still taught different types of trades. And so drafting was part of the core curriculum with different maths and sciences. So I learned how to do drafting like by hand and I was really good at that and my drafting teacher would always submit uh, my drawings into these sort of citywide competitions and I won so that gave me some confidence that I was good at what I did um, and a guidance counselor um, found uh, that the University of Notre Dame had a summer program for high school students between their junior and senior year and my best friend and I, who also happens to be a black female architect, went uh, and lived on campus for three years, which was awesome. Uh, and I was good there. Um, I won an award for my work during the summer program. The professors encouraged my uh, parents to have me apply, so I did. And that's how I ended up at Notre Dame. It was complete coincidence. I'm not Catholic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but it was 90 minutes from home, uh, so it was far enough away to be away from my parents, but close enough to hop on a train and be there. So all of those things kind of pointed that right direction. And I really love Mike Brady of the Brady Bunch. I love their house. I love that he drew all the time. And he would always, like, seriously, that was like a little bit of an influence. So all those things kind of conspired <laughs> to make me an architect. And you can probably find me here. And the point of this is that my world drastically changes, mm. right? So now I'm one of three African-American students in a class of 47. I'm also uh, a gender minority. There were only seven women in our class out of 47, which is the only thing that's radically changed over the last 30 years since being an undergrad. Um, undergrad architecture programs are now 50-50 women or men. Um, but the racial um, composition has not changed very much at all. In fact, of all licensed architects, uh, architecture is a field for which you have to be licensed. There are about 116,000 licensed in the United States. Uh, just over or under, just around 500 are black women, of which I am one. I don't practice anymore, but I was one of the first in the state of Illinois to be licensed in the 90s, which to me was insane. Like, mm -hmm. there were still these kinds of firsts. So I'm in a really different environment, and this would come to shape the rest of my career, that I, I would always sort of find myself being different from the normative. Um, but you know, I was a, a student of excelling, and so I was just going to excel, and I did. 
but I and I did I did so easily, even though my context was different. I shouldn't say easily. You know, my first my year was a little rough, um, but but I I I was committed to the field. I was good at it. I found an easy way to engage with my classmates, even though they were different from me. I don't know where that came from. I don't remember my parents teaching me anything other than to be a good person of excellent and treat others how you treat themselves. Um, but I went through Notre Dame fairly easily. I graduated, landed my first job back in Chicago at SOM, actually my second job. I interned in summers in Atlanta. Um, but I ended up being sort of situated uh, in this for the rest of my career and navigate it. There I am there. Um, I go on um, to SLM in Chicago, which is a fairly large and famous architecture firm uh, responsible for the John Hancock building in Chicago, the Sears Tower, other prominent buildings. Working with one of the um, prominent architects of the day, Bruce Graham, who designed buildings all over the world. This was my first project I worked on in London. Um, I then transitioned into urban design and planning, predominantly because I started after doing the work in London and Barcelona, I started working in Chicago, which was my hometown, and doing projects in and around the city that I knew and grew up in. But they were much more at the urban scale. So they were downtowns and neighborhoods. And I was beginning to meet with clients who were community organizations, the departments of planning. I was like, oh, I think I like this scale much better. And I began to see my city and the way it was and wasn't through a really different lens. You start asking questions, well, right. why this, why that? Why is this here? Why is that not there? Was that perspective different from your upbringing on the south side of Chicago? Like, did no. you maybe see a new, from a new vantage point your city? Well, or? I saw it from a new vantage point, right? These were not things I questioned up until I started doing this work right. now five or six years into working. The questioning part became new, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, and like, again, like I said, most of my existence as a black Chicagoan was on the south side of Chicago. So everything I knew was that. And I valued it differently than someone else might v value it coming in. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. It had no reason to have to go on the north side, which was the whiter part of town, because everything I wanted to do or needed to do was on my side of town, too. Mm -hmm. And there just weren't many spaces where you could interact with people who were different from you unless you were downtown right. working. And one other neighborhood, Hyde Park, which is the Hyde Park, the neighborhood I moved back to after college because I wanted to now be in a racially mixed neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? Because I had had this five years of doing that. So I'm going to fast forward through this. So I, after doing that work at SOM, I took a fellowship at Harvard and then decided I wanted to be in the public sector. There was a very pivotal mm -hmm. shift around well, I want to know who's making the decisions about where investment goes, why investment looks a certain way here and not there. And I realized that it was city agencies and governments and government that were controlling a lot of what architects do, what developers do, et cetera. So I wanted to be on the client side. You know, I had all these skills as a designer, but my clients didn't have that same type of language or skill set. So I wanted to put that on the okay. other side of the table. So I go on to DC and Newark, et cetera, to do all this kind of planning work. So now as I come out of Chicago and I'm working in different cities, first questioning in Chicago, then DC and Newark, I'm realizing that the same problems exist in every city. And one of the major problems that I saw was the racial divide. Does anyone know what city that is? It's a map of a city, by the way. You do, you can't say. <laughs> yes. It is. Does anyone know, know what this is a map of? Race. Yes. And elaborate. What do you see? The red dots are? White. Blue dots are? Black. Okay. <laughs> and there is some orange, which is Hispanic, and there is some green, which is Asian. So we all like to believe that we, you know, are, are in a world where the, the physical boundaries of, of race are erased. And maybe in the workplace and on campus, there is a daily a proximity and a minimum we have to people who are different. And maybe you can go a little further that there's the occasion that there's actually an interaction. And then you can go a little bit further to say there's actually a relationship. And I view those three things as different. 
But when we're not in those spaces for however many hours a day, this is how we look. Yeah, like, I think it's interesting too, this is a little bit of a zoomed out perspective. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about um, and the various tools that became available to you to see this kind of thing. So like the interest in urban history, I know you've done a lot about you know, tracing mm -hmm. um, some of these key moments in the history of American cities and how that then translates into why a particular city or site is the way that it is. Well, um, I think it's twofold. I think I first became aware of it through data. So now I'm working in the public sector. I'm the deputy planning director in Washington, D.C., and then I then went on to be the planning director in Newark, New Jersey, for Cory Booker during his first term. So as you're doing you know, spatial or policy plans for cities, whether it's at the scale of the whole city or different districts or neighborhoods, part, there are a couple of things that are informing your approach to being projective about improvement. Right? Some of it, like what is the existing condition? So as many of you know, in urban studies, you know, you're using secondhand data to help you paint a picture of what's happening in this place. And then you looked at trend data. Well, has it changed over the last 10 years, 15 years, 30 years? What is it projected to do? So data becomes one way. And I became really interested in geospatially mapping the data. So it's one thing to have the statistic in my hand and a graph. It's another thing to spatialize it, right? So the first thing is, begin to spatialize how these conditions show up. And you start overlaying them, and you start to see that the patterns start to stack on one another. The second thing is to look at the sort of trajectory of policies. You know, what's been implemented? By who? What decisions were made? And then you can also map those. Where were investments made over the last five years in this city? You know, where were transit improvements made? Where were open space improvements made? Where was there affordable, subsidized housing built versus market rate housing built? And where was it not built? And to see if it begins to reinforce the pattern that the existing condition shows. And then the third informant is talking to people who are in these places, residents, business owners, civic leaders. Does their lived experience match or map onto the data? Sometimes it aligns completely. Other times, it's not necessarily, as the data suggests. Crime is a really great example of real and perceived data sets. The data that is reported to us, that is tracked statistically, and then someone's experience of safety or security or protection can be and are often radically, radically different someone's sense that downtown is not safe because it's vacant. In St. Louis, for example, had the lowest crime stats mm -hmm. than other parts of the city where, that were more populated. But the perception of the physical environment led someone to believe that it was unsafe. Or depending on who you are and your identity will also map sometimes inconsistent to that perception. Mm -hmm. So there are certain data sets where the layering of those three informants is really crucial to paint a real picture of what's sort of happening. Yeah, that's great. OK. That's it. <laughs> that's a very long answer to just the first question. <laughs> so I mean, this is great because I think um, like it's helpful to kind of hear a little bit about your trajectory mm -hmm. and to get a sense of um, the various skill sets, skill, skill sets that you were developing, the various kinds of settings, and then the shift that you made from the private to the public sector, and, and why mm -hmm. you know what you were interested in, sort of what was behind that shift. Um, but from there, I think it would be helpful for us to know a little bit about um, like the Just City framework, and so how that kind of came forward as a useful concept or framework or name, right, to, to sort of describe the the thing that you're after, and then also the process by which you're working with people to achieve it. Yeah. Um, and I see up here what is justice. So perhaps <laughs> this is a good moment to start with. Yeah, sure. Like what that means to you, okay. and then how that feeds into the yeah. larger framework. Well, you know, I, I will say that this this term came to me more recently than further away. Like I didn't go into architecture with the language of justice at all. I was completely into the designing of beautiful buildings and spaces, right? 
Um, it wasn't until while I was at SOM and I started working in Chicago at the urban scale, and we were doing some pro bono work for some neighborhoods on the south side, which was great because I was the first time I had a client that actually looked like me and working in neighborhoods that I knew. Um, but it was there that, and the reason why I applied for the Loeb Fellowship at the GSD, because I didn't understand, and this was at the beginning of a community development movement in Chicago, rooted in cultural heritage development. So let's take, for example, I'm going to take a kind of gross stereotype around Chinatowns. Right? For all their worth, good or bad, for all the appropriated <laughs> cultural sort of artifacts uh, and imagery, uh, these are neighborhoods that have an iconography that makes themselves visible. They're shrinking by the minute because they're usually situated in neighborhoods in the path of gentrification closer to downtown as one kind of archetype. And then another archetype, archetype because Chicago is so much an ethnic city. You know, I was just looking at the parts of um, the South Side where a large concentration of Mexican immigrants have been rooted there for generations or Polish um, communities, that these communities seem to be able to thrive within themselves, mm -hmm. right, and celebrate their identity. And there's an economic, a positive economic flow of capital coming in and out. And then I looked at the South Side where black folks were, and I didn't see the same sort of cycling of investment. I saw, I didn't know at the time what, what, why that was, but I questioned it. It's like, I don't understand why this doesn't happen. Why? Are we not celebrating black culture like as a place that I want to be and go and partake, as opposed to a place that's feared or disinvested in? So I wrote a, a proposal to kind of explore that. So that, that kind of first aha moment, I mm -hmm. think, again, I'm not using this language, mm -hmm. sort of sets me off on a quest for trying to figure that out. Fast forward, it really wasn't until um, Trayvon Martin, mm. and then Mike Brown and Ferguson. And in fact, Ferguson maybe is maybe a moment to pinpoint even further. Because around that incident in the months that followed was the broader question of why did that happen, right? Because we started looking at this is a black first ring suburb controlled by white leadership both in terms of um, political leadership, school district leadership, policing, county jurisdictions that were pushed out of Pruitt-Igo. If you know, does anyone know what Pruitt-Igo is? Anybody? Anybody? Pruitt-Igo is a really famous public housing development in St. Louis that only existed for 30 years because the management was so deplorable and it just devolved that. They just demolished it. They couldn't figure out what to do with it. So all those people got displaced to Ferguson. So the articles after the murder sort of, the narratives about the murder dif dissipated, the question of why, like, what is the context in which that can happen? So now you're all in our space, right? You're exactly mm -hmm. in the space of this room. And the language of justice was starting to bubble up again. So, so for me, like I'm a, I'm a generation that's before, uh, I, I'm a generation after civil rights and, and black power movements, right? So I'm in this kind of weird zone where there really wasn't a movement in my age, unless you count apartheid in South Africa. But on, in my backyard, there really wasn't a movement. So here becomes a wave of a movement happening and a shift in language. And I just became to be really focused on that because in the design world, the language was sustainability and resilience and mm -hmm. equity. And it was becoming so ubiquitous that people would use it and I would ask them what they meant and they couldn't tell me what it meant, which was a little infuriating to me. So I chose just because I wanted to be more provocative in the moment where we were being literally vis visibly exposed to the harm of black people. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to challenge whether by using a more provocative, disruptive language, could I engage people in furthering the agenda that they say that they want. Yeah. So language really does matter to me. Um, 
there was a convening that we did, um, and there were just a lot of there was just a group of designers that I brought together just to get in a room together and unpack. Does language matter? Does it? Matter? Mm -hmm, Can we mm -hmm. really affect this or not? Um, and so everyone has a different interpretation of it, which is why I think language is so important. Yeah, and also understanding it theoretically versus yeah. from the ground up. Yeah, right. And so there, there, was, there was a class I taught called Design for the Just City where I asked students to really unpack what this means. What is justice in the built environment and in design actually look like? We had like an Instagram page where students had to go around and photograph things in the built world that were just or unjust based on their experience. And then the students would tag each other and talk about it. So but let's break down what is justice. So this distributive justice is the most common form, I think. Well, the second most common form I think people talk about, which is um, fairness and what people receive. Like, does everybody have the same access to parks and open space? Does everyone live within 10 minutes of public transportation? Right? Have we, and sort of talking in the built world, right, in cities, does everyone, have we distributed the resources equally? Is, is affordable housing distributed in every neighborhood fairly? We should all be doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a no, right? So distributive justice. The most common one, if you were to ask the man on the street, is procedural. Now, they wouldn't say procedural justice. They would say criminal justice. Mm -hmm. So the thing that you know, the average person most connects to is our kind of court system of fairness. So the first one is about, do we have something in fairness? Mm -hmm. This is about a, a fairness of process or fair play. The moment we're in right now is talking about restorative justice, which you know, on paper is to put something back the way it was. I think some populations have been, who have been harmed in this country or that were not always treated, were, were not initially treated on the same footing as others, women, people of color, would say restoring, maybe we're not restoring it because I never had it in the mm -hmm. first place. Like the way it was is not good. So reparative, restorative, these are kind of frames that are starting to move into our work. And then lastly, by a, a scholar, Setha Lowe, out of the Graduate Center at uh, CUNY, sort of talks about this interactional one, which then suggests that the way in which we have to have mutual respect and trust for one another is also a form of justice. Mm -hmm. And she would argue that in the work that we do, where we're working with communities or people of difference to try to get to that outcome, mm -hmm that that's the one you have to establish first if you want any of the other ones to come online. Yeah. So part of this for me and my exploration of, OK, I put, I'm interested in this word. What does it mean? <laughs> I created a course so that I could unpack it for myself through a class with students um, and sort of teach it for a few mm -hmm. years. So classes and syllabi are ways that professors also get to <laughs> sort of explore things that we're interested no. in with you. That little never happens. Little <laughs> secret. Um, so this is what's emerging. And I think and the point is, it can be different. And perhaps the pursuit yeah. of justice might need to look different. The strategy, the tactic, the policy that you develop may need to look different given the context. Right. That's your end. So yeah. we even have to think about the multiple meanings right. of these terms. I mean, one of the questions that came up in our discussion of this, and we had gotten to see another talk that you gave in mm -hmm. St. Louis, so this was familiar to mm -hmm. us, but um, was the difference between restorative and transformative justice. Mm -hmm. And I think you talked about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So do you use transformative justice as a framework? Do you see restorative as like leading to transformation in this way? And it also relates to a question that I had about the word disrupt, because mm -hmm. I, I know you use that a mm -hmm. lot, like you want to disrupt mm -hmm. things, and it's in the title of your forthcoming book. And I just wanted to hear a little bit about how disruption fits into this yeah. framework. You know, I have, I don't know that I've heard transformative justice a lot. What, what, what have you guys talked about that it means? Where's Jack? I'm going to call him out. Call him out. <laughs> Jack? Yeah. <laughs> I, are, are you referencing the question? I, the I am. Um, <laughs> or anybody can answer this. I don't mean to put Jack on yeah, this. Yeah, go ahead. While he's look, like, while Jack uh, is looking. The way that 
I've heard it described as like sort of taking restorative justice to the next step, acknowledging that like um, whatever caused harm is like systemic. So as a part of like um, healing that harm in an individual, it shifting the system so that it doesn't happen again. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. I don't, you know, I, I honestly don't have a question, an answer yeah. for that because I haven't really thought about the term. It's a little mm. new to me, so I wouldn't, I can't today say it, yeah. I would use it synonymously. I have to ponder yeah. that a, a little bit more. connected a little bit to some of the like theories of the just city that we were mm -hmm. discussing and reading, and one was a piece by Susan Feinstein, mm -hmm. your college at, colleague at mm -hmm. Harvard, who more or less believes that you can affect change within the system, that mm -hmm. there's room for this kind of yeah. you know, work to happen within existing mm -hmm. systems and structures. And then we also read David Harvey, who's just the opposite, and critiques <laughs> Susan Feinstein. We and, do that in class too, yes, which completely you know, <laughs> throws the students off. So like. you, we need a complete overhaul <laughs> yeah. of the system by any means necessary, and mm -hmm. we need to protect the right yeah. to the city. So, um, and we kind of, I guess, kind of came to some sort of a balance between the two that maybe mm -hmm. both can happen at the same time, that mm -hmm. there's space for change within the system mm -hmm. as well as space for yeah. protest and radical overturn. Yeah. So we were kind of, that's where we left it. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'm compl I, I completely believe that these are not either or questions. Mm -hmm. They just can never be, like when you go out in the world. It's a both and, it's a this then that. It's a this, then this, and that, and th right? It's, you know, because it's, it's never ending work. Yeah, and contextual, like you said. Right, and it's very contextual. You know, I, it, if I'm working, you know, uh, in Johannesburg versus working in Phoenix, it's very different context, mm -hmm. on very different sort of trajectories in terms of their pursuit of justice and what they're designing justice uh, for. So I think all of these have to be activated at different times, at different moments, by different people, and sometimes they're working simultaneously. Can you say something about disrupt? I would love to hear. So, and maybe this is a bit more synonymous with mm. transformative, but again, because I like language, I'm trying to solicit a different reaction. And so transformative, feels too safe mm. and vanilla <laughs> and even um, jargony. Disrupt is a protest language. It's an action. It's an action. <laughs> like it is, it implies, I'm about to break some, you know, <laughs> stuff up or something, right? And I just feel like we are at this moment when we know that we have to dismantle systems, build new systems, disrupt within systems, or change within systems. I just feel like each of those needs different types of hammers if in fact you're gonna to try to roll out a different mm. outcome. So for me in my mind, there's always a, this little tiny hammer <laughs> that I see where I look for, you know, what's the thing that just sort of breaks the current thinking mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be big or bold or harmful. It's just to get you to think about something a different yeah. way. And it can be something really small in the context of a conversation you're trying right. to have with people who are different. Or it can be something on the scale of radical policy reform. That's great. Reform. In but my class, we call them breaks. So the hammer analogy is perfect. Okay, so, <laughs> so there we go. So yeah. yeah. So I, 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 I am trying to morph myself into being um, more disruptive mm -hmm. when I can. Yeah. So could we move now into what that looks like? OK, perhaps? sure. <laughs> um, um, let me bridge this a little bit sure. as I put it in here. Sure. So another interesting quote that came from this convening we had was, we have an identity that demands justice, but we also have an identity that demands participating in justice for others. How are we making space to hear that and act on that? So your professors and I you know, have the work of teaching this work um, with a diverse group of students who come from diverse backgrounds 
And we all bring, though, our own experiences and biases, whether we intend to do so or not. Right? We teach international students. Uh, we teach students from our hometown. But our experiences may not be as diverse as even the collective of the class. Right? And so I've always so recognizing I'm not teaching at an HBC or something where everybody looks like me. I'm often teaching in a room where most people don't look like me. So how do I share my experience while at the same time helping you to tap into your own identity and equip, with you, the, equip you with the tools, given where you stand, to work with communities of difference, to work with leaders of difference, colleagues of difference, to work on issues that you have not experienced but you want to make a difference in, right? So the who is not only about who we're working on behalf of, I think the who is also about who we're working with. The who is also ourselves. And I think, you know, for students who have earnestly asked me, you know, how do I, uh, as a white kid from Oklahoma City, work in this community that I know nothing about? And I tend to respond by saying, to kind of tap into and own that you are a white kid from Oklahoma City. This is what you know, this is what you don't. But there are a series of human experiences that you likely have, and that is your point in. A community that looks like it's gonna eat you alive also has you know, a, a through line of humanity as well. right? And so you're each looking for that, believe it or not, and so you just you learn these ways to try to equip yourself to humble yourself, I think, a mm -hmm. little bit, expose yourself a little bit, um, mm -hmm. as you would want your audience to. But you know, I have focused on this. So now you know, is racial racial justice now important to me? Mm -hmm. I think people would uh, assume that it is because. You look at me and you think that this is an issue I care about. <laughs> and it happens to be because the cities that I've worked in over the last decade um, tend to have these stark contrasts between predominantly African Americans, but increasingly more people of color and white Americans. And so be, we are in this moment and taking advantage of the moment to disrupt the way in which we have not talked about these issues in different spaces. And again, to build a language so that we can talk about them and use the language without coding it. Because I think when we code it, we can't really get at the, the crux of it. And we all have to figure out the language to use to get at the crux of it. That doesn't feel like you're going to say something to me that I'm going to take the wrong way. And that I have to allow you to say something and build a shared kind of language, right? Mm -hmm. But some of that starts with really understanding the difference. And so this is a, a, a kind of the trajectory, and it's really in this sort of same space of defining justice, I guess. Um, that I'm starting to teach in um, our INDES program, Masters of Design Studies in the Public Domain, which is how do we understand how, um, in the American context, we've set up this condition and, and this pursuit of justice. And so, we read, um, oh my gosh, uh, Stand Your Ground. Um, the author's name is Brown, and I can't think of her whole name. It just, I just had a brain fog. Um, but she has this really, inter it's a really interesting book. She's um, at Union Theological Seminary, and she writes this book um, that in the end is, traces all the way to the Stand Your Ground Law of Florida in the Trayvon Martin case. But she pushes it all the way back to the founding of America and the canons under which it was founded. And the Stand Your Ground laws as it relates to land, which is as fundamentally American as anything else, the ownership of land, right? And so in the founding of the United States, right, the founders and various canons set up American exceptionalism, which is white-based. So we should all just kind of get ourselves comfortable with the fact that that's sort of steeped in the American canon, right? 
in these diagrams, and you'll see as I progress on the diagrams, the, the familiar kind of diagrams that you've seen, right? In this American exceptionalism, the white body is the supreme. Other bodies, and I could easily have put a female figure, because the female figure is not on that pedestal. We should be very clear about that, right? But the, the body of color, the black body, this is the baseline of the United States of, the, of America. And all the laws and things that are sort of predicated on that founding start with this. So coming out of Jim Crow in the early, the latter part of the last century, the pursuit is equality. We are all equal. So we get this equal platform, but you've already sort of said that this body is more superior to that. So we can stand on the same chair, but we're still not equal. And by the way, women are still over here too. <laughs> um, we then go into the next era of movement, which is the kind of the one we're in and questioning, which is equality. Right, so now there's this feeling that when we talk about like forms of distributive justice or restorative justice, I can't give everybody the same thing. I've got to level the playing field because I had already disadvantaged you way back then. So I now need to sort of offset for the disadvantage that I gave you to make you equal. But, you know, as we continue to look at the challenges of African Americans, immigrants, people of color, that body is still not valued at the same scale as that one, right? So what we're really after, the we being people here, this can be around LGBTQ, I think women are still in this bucket in some ways, is something that looks like this. So when you begin to hear this kind of language coming from different communities that are in this kind of movement work of liberation, this is what they're after that my body and your body are actually valued the same way, right? So the Just City Lab starts with this super simple question. Well, it starts with a moment in my career and a question. The moment in my career is at the end of working for Cory Booker, and I realized I never wanted to stay in government forever. It was a little bit of an experiment. I wanted to be on the client side as opposed to the consulting side. And so that was great. And, I, and again, I'm starting, it's the same problem, the same set of conditions, and so I felt like I was just doing the same kind of plan over and over again. So I was like, you know what? I think I'm done with urban planning and architecture. So I enrolled in culinary school. <laughs> so I quit my job without a job, which was the second time I had done that. So it wasn't as scary the first time, and I had a little bridge contract, so I had some income flowing. It's like, I want to go to culinary school. So I looked into going to culinary school, really expensive. <laughs> so I couldn't do it. So I enrolled in a, um, an amateur class at the French Culinary Institute for 22 weeks. And once I finished it, I could take a, a, a test, an exam, if I really wanted to go professional, take the exam, and then I could go into the next session. So I was like, perfect, I'll do that. Um, and so it was glorious. I loved it. I loved it. It really saved me during COVID when people were hoarding. Um, I made Worcestershire sauce out of ingredients in my cabinet. That was awesome. <laughs> uh, Bloody Mary out of tomato paste. It was really good. Um, uh, but I got a call from the Kresge Foundation in Detroit to say, hey, you know, we've got this massive problem. The city is shrinking. We're hemorrhaging population. We're on the crust of bankruptcy. We really don't know what to do. We, you know, they give me your name. We'd love for you to come and run this project for us. So I went there, talked to the mayor and everybody, and it was kind of like a stream job. It was just like, mm -hmm. here's a meaty problem for the second largest, um, I think the city with the largest African-American population at the time. So it's like a black city, black leadership, black space. And all the things that I'd been mm -hmm. wrestling with in the cities before, I could do so in a way that was kind of unencumbered by the bureaucracy of working within systems and to take on the whole city at this whole scale. Mm -hmm. So I, was, I would go to Detroit for three or four days a week and then come back and go to culinary school on Saturday because I was committed to finish. Anyway, all of that is to say, while I was doing that work, again, just reflecting like, 
is this going to make a difference? Because I was mm -hmm. still using like conventional planning tools to do this work, and we were able to be disruptive. You know, I'm doing Detroit, and the justice language still isn't in my frame. That comes actually after the trade. Mm. So I get this opportunity to set up this research lab where I can just kind of go, I don't really know if, if design makes a difference in equity. Like, let's just call the bullshit. Like, I don't know if it does. I know we like to say it does. But I'm, you know, I keep going to places where it's the same problem over right. and over again. We're investing in those places. We're building great housing. You know, we're building big parts. But, you know, people are still, mm -hmm. you know, not where they should be. The inequality is still deep and real. This is not enough. It just isn't enough. And so I just wanted to, design is not a field for which there's a lot of research and evidence-based work that demonstrates the impact of what we do, other than aesthetically, right? Environmentally, in some cases. So I just wanted to create a space where I can examine the question. And with students in different classes and different research projects, we could come back with the result that, yeah, maybe it does all the time. Or maybe it does this way and that way. And so we just started doing this work where we took on a whole bunch of different approaches to how to do it. And then ultimately, someone was like, Tony, you have to tell us what you think it means. So that's what I said it meant at the time. Um, so we launched on doing different types of research uh, that looked at you know, how designers take up this topic. Um, we did some case studies and interviews with them to ask us to walk us through your methodology, tell us what condition of injustice you wanted to confront, and then you self-critique your own project. Was there something specific you did in the design that you think changed the trajectory or the outcome of how people experienced it? Um, we write and publish, and we do reports, which you've seen, it seems. Um, we've done exhibitions to introduce people um, and connect people to the work, usually through our case studies and oral histories. We've had the good fortune to travel to um, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Cape Town, Johannesburg, different parts of the US, uh, to mount different conversations and convening to test some of the ways that the index can be used specifically to generate conversation about this. Um, we did a study in New York looking at public space and developed a whole framework of indicators and metrics so you really could evaluate the performative aspects of justice in the public realm. Um, I think you've probably seen uh, the Just City Index, and we use that as a tool to engage and really to help communities, cities, leaders, organizations define what that means for them and to expand the vocabulary they can use to be more specific about the intention that they're after. Um, early on, we kind of crowdsourced it with mm -hmm. students. Uh, and they did different projects to ask people what they thought it meant. And from three years of crowdsourcing, that's what generated the index. We just collected all the different terms and things. This is a page from the Oh City or Not uh, Instagram mm -hmm. page where students had to go and photograph different conditions of injustice and justice. So it taught them to go out and be observers of the world and to look for the environmental conditions that you think are just or, or unjust or unjust and to have a conversation about them and begin to you know, educate folks around what they should and shouldn't stand for. Um, we collaborated with professors. Um, this was a photography um, uh, class at Harlem School of the Arts that partnered with one of the architecture schools. The students went out and photographed their community and used those photographs as prompts and conversations with the architecture students to develop the, the design propositions within the design studio course. Uh, they do other types of mapping of injustice over space that look at design features. Students had to do manifesto videos that began to talk about um, their manifesto for what a just city would look like. And then for all the kind of convenings we do, we actually track um, and, and ask our participants to rank this. And so what's interesting about this is, and it just proves evidence, what I want to prove is justice is not the same for everyone in every place. And so this, we now have some actual data that bears that out to be true. It may seem self-evident, but Again, design mm -hmm. is not an evidence-based field, and I wanted to create evidence. Yep. So this first one is from a conference on aging. And so we would ask people, 
uh, and the, the audience was mostly people over the age of 55 or so. And so housing stability was most important for aging populations. This is a group of designers here in the middle. Political power was one of their most prominent instances of injustice. Power then became their most prominent sort of value in the space of the power they have to change. And then this one is um, our GSD Black and Design Conference, which is mounted by our African American Student Union, happens every two years. And so while it was predominantly a, a, a group of um, black uh, designers, it was actually a really diverse population. And for them, power showed up mm. again. So it, we like kind of doing these experiments and then doing the comparative analysis to sort of see. And in fact, that map I showed you at the very beginning of this little section we're on, if I can go back, right? So we collect these, and this was just for all the convenience we did in the US, to sort of see just based on the US region, which parts of the country prioritize different sort of aspects of justice. And so I can't, this was around 2018 or 19, I think. And so in the South, what was happening was after Charlottesville mm -hmm. and the sort of ripping down of Confederate identities in public space, which is why identity popped up really prominently there. Um, Housing is always a crisis in the Northeast, as we all know. So ownership and community and power <laughs> tended to be constant. You know, we're still coming off of Michael Brown in the Midwest, so trust kind of showed up more. So we like we loved kind of getting a sense of the temperament of the country by region, by city. You can sort of drill it down to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And the values of a city might look different from neighborhood to neighborhood. But then it allows you guys to have conversations across communities within a city to find where the shared values are. My premise was, if I can get people to talk about their shared values, mm. it might make it easier for them to come to a table and talk about the specific, tangible, things they wanted, as opposed to starting with the material things, right? So I, I'm, always, yeah. I'm trying to find the commonality of our humanity to start the difficult conversation in the context where we have so much bias um, and see if that could be a way to get to a different disruptive mm -hmm. outcome. So I'll go back to where we were, and you can yeah, ask I me a question. Yeah, I love this the, like, sort of organic, flexible nature it of all this. It was completely organic. Yeah, I so think we, that's great. we spec. So I also speculate by the, using the design studios. Mm -hmm. So this was uh, one of our favorite studios, which was in St. Louis. Um, uh, 99 provocations to disrupt injustice and saying, Louis, yes, I do use disruption a lot. <laughs> so this is that same racial dot map. This is now St. Louis. Um, the green is the African American population in this case, and the blue is white. Um, this is the St. Louis arch, and that's sort of downtown that cuts through. And there's always this really interesting kind of middle ground space, right, that divides the two. Um, but stark divides in this city as well. Mm. The students first had to map 99 problems. So every student had to use data observation. So we started the research before we went to St. Louis, and then in St. Louis they got to do field work. And I challenged them to come up with 99 different problems. They actually came up with 126. And yes, I was riffing off of JC when we did this. Um, and then we indexed them around different thematics. And the students did desktop research and others to actually document and create infographics and, and geospatial um, data points and references for each of these. And they're all distinct, right? Uh, the students then, in working in teams, had to craft their own manifesto for Adjust St. Louis, which is an exercise I love to do with all types of convenings. And then we created a taxonomy of 99 different solutions. Mm -hmm. So the students had to come up with a solution to each of those 99 problems, which freaked them out because usually a design studio has one problem, one project. So they had to each come up with like six to nine different problems. But we did this big charrette, and they were able to do it, and then they, were, they rocked and rolled. And so um, all these different types of ideas. So this one called Live, Work, and Play. Downtown St. Louis had a lot of vacant office buildings. 
so and which created again that kind of crime imbalance. People thought it was uh, crime ridden, it wasn't. It was just a ghost town. And so this student was trying to figure out well how to bring vibrancy and life, twenty four seven weekday weekend. So the office building is um, converted to oh the other data point was that most people commute from the suburbs to work downtown and then they leave. So this student had the idea of creating a kind of hoteling Airbnb. So if you, if you were a commuter, you can Airbnb in one of these buildings and kind of work there nine to five, you know, for five days a week and then go back. That way you were forced to like spend money there during the week, which was generating an economy in the downtown and a, a demand for more retail and offerings. So you had a built-in population for more than just the eight hours of the day. And then those units would transition over to a conventional Airbnb for the weekend. So she was trying to find these multiple uses of occupancy mm -hmm. to drive population that then would drive local business and then drive the economy. Yeah. So that was a cool idea. Um, this student, based on some health statistics, speci specifically around young people and mental health. I don't know if you all have read Mindy Fuller Love's Root Shock, mm -hmm. which talks about the um, mental, the she is a clinical psychologist, the documented mental stress of living in a neighborhood of blight and disinvestment, particularly for multiple generations. And so this student recognizing that and then declining um, school age um, grades and educational attainment um, created this root shock in reverse. So she sets mm -hmm. up these um, mental health stations designed as cartoons on streets, in public spaces for young people who don't know how to access someone to talk to, don't know that they're having a mental health crisis, that you can just sort of randomly and honestly sit on a park bench and talk to someone and get some kind of advice. And of course, it's for everyone, but the idea to put them into cartoon characters was a way for her to create some accessibility for a young person. Um, this one is around utilizing the underside of the freeway to create spaces of play and what otherwise is a dangerous spot. And this one is a more temporal idea because there's a lot of vacant land, as you can see here in St. Louis. And so she had this idea of floral patch, which is just to sort of flower bomb um, different vacant lots with different seasonal planting so that in different seasons you would just have these blooms. And so there would just be this natural beauty that would show up instead of a dusty vacant lot and to sort of keep mm -hmm. that going as a, a statement. So they were excited that they can come up and yeah. so you can see that we index the problems, the values, the disruptive combination. So sometimes student interventions work in combination. You can kind of stack them mm -hmm. onto each other and accumulate different ideas. And what I really loved about this and my attention for it was that students could think more disruptively than they thought. Mm -hmm. Right, they, they, I, I, in design studios, I seek for students to try to do something that is not within current practice, which is very hard to do, right? Because you're also taking courses to tell you how, to do, how things get done. And so the design studio is the space of imagination. And so it's kind of asking you to go back to your 10-year-old self and make up something that you don't know is implausible. Yeah. But there could be some plausibility in it if we just allow ourselves to imagine a little bit more. That's awesome. So I like love the ideas that you shared, and I, the sort of the space for imagination I think is really really important. But I just wanted to hear a little bit more about um, like where you see the potential challenges of the work. So I would love to imagine that everybody has access to this. Everybody's there at the table. Everybody has ideas. Mm -hmm. At some point along the way, they reach consensus, but I know that that probably doesn't happen that way mm -hmm. all the time. So where do you see the challenges? Um, what happens when you actually land somewhere where everyone's not you know, the same way engaged or not able to participate fully? Like, what are yeah. some of the moments that you've seen? Sure. Before we do that, I mean, because I know people are leaving me have other classes. Any questions or comments so far? Let me just take a break and see if anybody has a note they scribbled down that they wanted to ask about or talk about or raise. Yes. Malcolm. Um, Hi, Malcolm. So you kind of talked about when you were uh, moving into kind of like a different community that you weren't um, used to. Mm -hmm. Syndrome. 
I'm having it right as we speak. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. We all are. Yes. <laughs> is that all? I'm sorry, was that yeah, no, the no, tour? No. Yeah, I haven't. Um, <laughs> I had it really bad last week, and here's why. Um, so my firm has um, been invited to exhibit in the Venice Architectural Biennial, uh, which starts in May. And it's a really big deal. It's every two years. We're exhibiting in the Central Pavilion with the likes of David Adage and the Astor Gates and some like super prominent. And this year's theme is also um, it's called The Laboratory of the Future. And it's the first time this particular international exhibition is featuring Africa and the African diaspora globally. So, I'm, so like I'm thrilled and I'm excited and I've been excited, but now that I know everybody that's in it, I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> I am so intimidated. Um, so yes, I have imposter syndrome often. Um, how do I overcome that? Is the question. Um, and maybe let me take it back to like in earlier parts of my career, because I think my imposter syndrome now is different than when I was, you know, just out of school a little while or, or mid-career. Um, I think early in my career, I wouldn't say that I had imposter syndrome. It's just that I knew that there was a lot to learn. And one of the things I think I always did, um, and my mother used to call me a sponge, like I observe people who are doing things the way I think I want to do them. And maybe you all do that and you just don't know you do it, but I, I was aware that I was a student of observing what I wanted to become in the world. So there were just people I would watch. I would watch people who I worked for and their ability to move a room to their ideas, right? And I was like, that's an amazing skill. I'm going to adopt that, right? I would watch how people designed, or I would watch how people would talk to someone to engender a particular reaction. So I think early in my career, I don't think I'd call it imposter syndrome. I was just trying to figure out how to be excellent, how to kind of get to this thing I want. I just, I just always remember being very focused on not a particular position, like I was like, I'm going to be a partner, but it was just the aspiration to be really good at what I did, right? which I later understood as just being really mission driven. There was just, I just wanted to be good and wanted to do something that mattered. So that was my early focus. I think in mid-career, because I was starting to do really well and I was being recognized, and then so all of a sudden I find myself alongside of these people who I've been admiring. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and then that's where I think I, you have to kind of find where is your center. Because I do think that there were these moments where it's like, oh, I, and I'm going to start quoting people you may or may not know. Oh, I need to write like Michael Sorkin, who I just thought was the most beautiful urbanist writer. Right? I gotta, it's got to sound like Michael Sorkin. Or you know, I've got to be a scholar, so now I've got to you know, write a syllabus and lecture like in, a, in, in this sort of scholarly frame, neither of which were me. Mm -hmm. And so I think there were moments where I would try to do it, and I, it would just be awkward. Like my body would just visibly not feel like this was right. And I just always had to sort of come back to sort of stay where you're comfortable. Stay with who you are. Just, just be who you are. Now, now, <laughs> that's not always hard, because you're, you're trying to excel in your career. You're trying to find friends and networks and relationships. So it's an awkward balance in that middle part of your, your life. But it's totally plausible and doable, and you will get through it. When you get on the other side of that, you're like, this is just who I am, and then it's all just in your head. <laughs> um, and um, But I think, and what I really love about your generation, I'm sorry, this is a long answer. Um, what I love and what I'm so inspired by of your generation that you all are so less encumbered by fitting in a box, I think, than I was when I was your age. So you might not feel like you have this latitude to really be who you are because you're measuring that against how others receive it, but you so have so much more latitude to do that and for people to accept it or not. I think that's also because you're much more entrepreneurial in mindset 
than my generation was at your age, and which makes you a little less risk adverse. Like you're willing to take some chances. I, that's also predicated on being in a position to take chances too. So I just think you have to kind of figure out how to put your guard rolls up to stay kind of at your core. I think the imposter syndrome sometimes is healthy. I think it's humbling. I think it allows you to check, you know, where you are, <laughs> where you aren't. And I think it also allows you to aspire to the thing that is kind of at the core of what, what drives you. So I hope that helps a little bit. Any other question before I go on to the last point of this? It was really great. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. It's been the most incredible talk. Oh, thank you. Um, and tell me your name. Misaya. Misaya. Um, earlier you were talking a bit about how design is not always the solution, and I was wondering if you could speak a bit more. Is that more talking about how it needs to be backed up by data? Um, yeah, I, would love to hear I can show you that through just a couple of examples. The last yeah. examples I have of some actual projects from practice. Yeah, that's a great question. Was there one more question in the back before I show you with pictures? <laughs> yes, please. Um, my name is Noah, and again, to echo the sentiment, thank you so much for being here. Sure. Um, it kind of relates to both work all the time, and I think Yeah. Defined list of priorities. Mm -hmm. um, and if somebody kind of like ebbs and flows between a lot of those different backgrounds, and sure. And part of that question ties back to your your professor's initial question, which the the um, projects will speak to. So good, I can wrap it up with all the examples. But I think to the, the part of the question that's about being interdisciplinary, I don't find that debilitating at all. In fact, I find it necessary. Right? And the good news is over the course of what will hopefully be a long career, you can acquire your interdisciplinary chops. So do not feel like in the remaining time you have here in Brown, you got to figure all that out before you get into the world. For me, it was really organic. I did not imagine I'm would be doing what I'm doing right now when I graduated Notre Dame. It was a, wasn't even an inkling in my head. But working at SOM, exposure to those projects opened up something. And then deciding to go to the fellowship opened up something. And then switching to a sector where I could transfer the skills I had had after working seven years opened up something else. And then a network opened up. And then that opened up. So this thing is just going to keep blossoming as you put yourself in space. So every opportunity you find yourself in from the one you're in now to the one after graduation are all just going to build. So don't feel the anxiety that you have to have that now. But it's not debilitating at all. I think it's, it's, it is increasingly necessary to deal with the urban challenges of your time without question, right? So let's talk about um, two things. So my practice, Urban American City, it was my way to now, so I worked all this time with Alpha's Justice Frame. I started this research lab to develop my point of view about it. So now I get to push it back into my private practice, kind of built on this concept of what I call just urbanism. And so these are the values that I think I check myself on in terms of the projects I take and the way we work and who we partner with. Restorative, disruptive, value-based cultural competency, cross or multidisciplinary, valuing community expertise and grassroots as a valid data set alongside grass tops and desktop research. It is inherently political, um, and it requires some accountability. Right. So one example I'm going to show you that goes back to St. Louis. I think all my examples are maybe St. Louis, um, is the Chodo Greenway. So we entered a design competition. Um, to do this five-mile five urban greenway through that middle white space of St. Louis, if you remember that map that was separated by blue and green. So we won the design competition, and the client said that they wanted this to be an equitable plan because the city was so divided racially and economically and everything else. So based on some research I've been doing in Pittsburgh, you know, I had started already thinking about what this just public realm was, right? 
So typically when we think about public realm or public spaces and how they're designed or maintained, we think about the capital you need, the maintenance needs, is it distributed well within your city? Does everyone have access to it? And what's the quality of the space? In the frame of sustainability and resiliency that's been around for the last 20 years, we're, we're thinking about who owns it and controls it and manages it. Is it the public sector or the private sector? Um, is it allowing for the retention of neighborhoods around it? Or we're increasingly seeing that we in, when we invest in public spaces, it begins to elevate the value around it and causes gentrification. And you know, does a healthy public park really help to engender the health of our human bodies and spirits, right? But then I wanted to be interested in, well, who's occupying this? So this is where we begin to parse out equity as a distributive sort of paradigm to are the, I keep doing that, I'm so sorry. Are the aesthetics and identity of how I design the public space suggesting and welcoming that all are welcome here, right? So now we're getting to this question of the role of what can, design can do, because there's a part of being just that's about, is it aesthetic that is white dominant American normative, and we don't recognize the ways in which that normative landscape or plan may actually suggest that someone is not included versus included. Um, who designs it? Who am I hiring as the architect? That was the other reason why I wanted to be in the public sector. I want to control who was hired. Who was I giving land to? Who was I giving public investments to? Um, so who's designing our spaces? Who's using our spaces? And this whole notion of the safety, protection, surveillance, security paradigm, which is so different based on our identities, right? So I deconstruct now as a part of the project, well, if we really want to talk about equity, my client's term, all of these things have to be considered. So we do conventional work. And the first thing we do, because they only wanted the trail to go east-west. And so our premise was, if you really want this to be an equitable plan, put a part of the trail that disrupts that dividing line, which is, by the way, called the Del Mar Divide. So here's where it's like design. Physically break the line, because it's a literal spatial line. So part of the reason why we won is because we convinced them to do the cross. And what the cross did is not only connect, connect the, the um, St. Louis Arch, the famous arch, to their Olmstead Park, Forest Park, it also then connected the prominent park in the black neighborhood to the prominent park in the white neighborhood. Design at that scale having an impact, right? So we do all this work to, uh, to study the feasibility, the connectivity, and then the impact, all the conventional things you would do in a public space project, right? Um, we then look at different landscape patterns, and we think about how it looks, the aesthetics, the materials. But then they wanted equity, <laughs> right? So how far could we go to get to something that was equitable? So again, we have to break down, well, what does equity mean? So as a part of the engagement that we did, we had very specific prompts uh, and ways to ask people, what would equity look like for you? And there were different exercises to either help people visualize what that meant to them. Of course, we used some aspects of the index. But we needed the community to tell us, is this even a term you use in your neighborhood? Is this just one of our plannery, jargony terms that means nothing to you. So how can I cultivate a, a, a language of a sense of the outcome of what we think about that with your own words, one. Two, let's break down the different ways that equity can show up. So in this that I will share with your professor, because you probably can't read it. Mm. So equity can show up as businesses and jobs and creating wealth. Like, are black people owning businesses and land all around this corridor? Was that going to produce a different type of equity, like a material equity? Because equity is sometimes thought of as capital, right? Um, can we produce equity around quality of life in neighborhoods? Um, is it envi are there environmental conditions we need to address? Are people healthy and wellness? Is there mobility, recreation, public safety, affordable housing? What are the things at the scale of the neighborhood? that the average person would say was equity. What about identity and culture? 
Are there things that represent my culture, my identity? Are they visible in the space? Can I design to them? And then civic and community particip participation. Who's at the table, right? Who's leading the workshop? Who are the designers that you hired? Do they look like me? Who's getting the contracts to build it? Do they look like the community? Who are you partnering with in the community to do programming, right? Are there local artists and designers, by the way, which we um, intentionally sought out and put on our team as a part of the designers and one of the um, black um, men designers from St. Louis got the first commission to do one of the public spaces on the Greenway, right? So how do you build that through all of these different components? So we had to elaborate and show people this menu. You can achieve equity in all these different ways. Now, is design going to have a real role in business incubation? Mm, maybe not that much. But it can have a real big role in art installations and programming, design place making, recreation, mobility spaces, affordable housing. So it also begins for us to see a way in which you need different disciplines at the table with you. And I would say I can collaborate with you on business incubation, but I'm not a driver of that. So another sector can collaborate with me on affordable housing, but maybe I'm more of a driver with a developer. So this type of map, this was the first project where I got to map out and show people different ways that you can pull on a lever that's related to justice or equity, and that there are multiple entry points to how you can get there. It doesn't look like one thing. It can't look like one thing. How do I help the average person understand that I've helped them achieve something that they would call equity, not me or the mayor, right? Because oftentimes they're a little different. So all of this elaborates on this. And it became a menu, right? So this is a section of the Greenway in a particular neighborhood. And so you can use that map I showed you in a community and have them prioritize which are the more important equity levers for this part of the Greenway, which may be different than the South Side or the South Side different from the North? You get to determine which of these strategies are the most important to your part of the Greenway, right? And you can do all sorts of engagements around that. And then those become the things that the different implementation partners work on for that section. That's not the same as another section because even in the same city there's difference. So that's sort of how we are adapting mm -hmm. the sort of research part of this into practice. That's great. Yeah. Um, OK, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to just I ask I got a, a little bit of the kind of three-way question. And I just want to ask you like a kind of closing question. Sure. And then um, if we have time, there can be some Q&A and continued conversation, of course. Yeah, because um, there's like this there's student a, kind of there's dialogue There's a student gathering, chat. yeah, at okay. five. So we can continue this okay. um, for sure. but. I just wanted to return us to kind of like the theme of the series and what mm -hmm. is the urban now and um, thinking about the just city, the framework, and then sort of the aspiration of it at mm -hmm. this particular moment um, in human history with everything that's going on. Um, like what should students, what should we take from this? Like what, what are you, what do you see as your next sort of phase of this? And then how can we align with what you're doing in ways that kind of, you know, collaboratively makes sense. Yeah. Um, maybe two parts. I think one is one of the things I've enjoyed over the last decade of having this platform, in addition to teaching courses and um, my practice, is preparing a generation to do this work maybe differently than I did when I was, you know, in the mid part of my career, right? So because we're at a moment where there is and the work requires allyship from all sorts of disciplines and identities to be a part of this work in the United States in particular, but people who are from other parts of the world have you know, your own sort of similar issues of injustice that you're confronting. So while we're in this moment where, where there is an earnest attempt and interest to build allyship to push on these issues that really do affect us all, whether they affect us in our household or not, is a moment that I wanted to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And so what I 
am hopeful about is that more people are kind of coming to this work. You're using this work to build a class around, which is so just humbling, <laughs> and I'm so honored uh, that the work has inspired you in that way. And so I hope each of you in small and or big ways find ways that pieces of this conversation or your class kind of affect the way you go about doing work in the world. And so that's what I'm the most hopeful about. I think personally, um, I think I have been experimenting with tapping into different ways to exercise creative practice to tackle the work. So I've had this part of the career where I've tackled it, not really, but I've been an architect where I wasn't necessarily tackling these issues. I was being the thing I wanted to be since I was 14, which then opened the door to me kind of understanding, oh, architects aren't the people who really design cities. There's a political process, and there's economics and capitalism that builds cities. So now I'm in, I play in that space, and I understand how to work, and I have different successes. But the perpetual nature of the underlying challenge that you all are inheriting and then will continue to work on. You know, a career's worth of that work is <laughs> exhausting, but when I was in it, well, I'm still in it, but in the prime of my career, to be in it was so exhilarating and so engaging, particularly when I was around other people working on these issues. And again, in each of the cities I work on, I've had that kind of success. And so I've explored that through the space of policy and even as a consultant. I'm now thinking about the different ways to use the thing that is at my core, which is creativity. Remember, I always used to like to draw. So how I use that little superpower to find other ways to speak about, have effect on, impact this. So writing has been one of those things that I haven't done in a while and I need to do that. But I've been making art, actually. So this exhibition is the second biennial that I've been invited to participate in, where I'm finding these different ways to talk about these issues, um, resolve them, and process them, actually, from, you know, to be really personally candid. This work, you also, if you're in it long enough, you also have to carve out your own little private space to just work through your own. <laughs> heaviness and weight of it outside of working on it on behalf of others. I have to kind of refresh and figure out how I kind of show up in it again. So the making of art has been that for me. And so there may be something that comes out of that that maybe you know, comes back and puts forward a disruptive policy or plan. And we're actually working on something very cool around uh, community uh, ownership in Chicago around vacant land. But I'm really kind of enjoying the kind of space of making mm. in a creative way as both a personal processing and hopefully a way to unpack some new disruptive idea that'll make a difference. Mm. Thank you so much for You're joining welcome. us today. I really appreciate it. Do you have any announcements, Sandy, for what's next? Oh, or? yeah, really quick. If anyone would like to join us back at Maxi Hall in 109, there'll be some refreshments and a chance to talk more informally with Tony Griffin. So please do come back if you'd like. And thanks for coming to uh, hang out with us today. And Thank um, you, um, they both have this presentation, which I'm more than happy you can share the PDF version. It has my contact information. Fantastic. You're welcome to reach out with questions. Um, you're welcome to apply to the GST <laughs> if you want more career. Um, yeah, it's really nice to meet you all. I hope I get to talk with some of you in a little bit.